convince us otherwise. The U.S. government does not place a high priority on preventing terrorism. Before the recent Iraq war started, there was plenty of intelligence predicting that the war would increase terror, which happened as predicted. The thing I'm most concerned about is that all these efforts on the part of the United States government are creating an atmosphere which is enhancing terrorism all around the world. There was a study that was done called the, the Iraq effect, and what he discovered is that the the amount of terrorism has increased seven times, sevenfold times since the United States has attacked Iraq. Terrorism all around the world. And that's going to that's gonna be one of the effects if the United States attacks uh, Iran. The constant threat of an enemy gets hardliners the support of the population. Remember how most Americans felt on 9-11. When a country is at war, it needs a strong leader who will not appease its enemies. It must convince the population that its enemies are irrational and bent on its destruction. It works for the hardliners in Tehran, just like it works for the hardliners in Washington. This brings us to Ahmadinejad, the much maligned, ultra-conservative president of Iran. As can be expected, his unrepentant, anti-Zionist, anti-Israel displays and defiance of U.S. demands to abandon the nuclear energy program are the media focus for our official enemy. When it comes to Iran, I think it's important that people keep Iran in perspective. Iran does have uh, real ambitions of, of being a major, major power in the Middle East. And that's, that's something to take very seriously. And their current president, Ahmadinejad, is somebody who loves to make provocative speeches um, and to do some really awful things. Uh, the, particularly for Jews and for Israel, uh, the, the conference that was held in Tehran a few months ago, that was essentially a celebration of Holocaust denial. Uh, however, however, Iran tried to, to sort of tone that down. That's essentially what it was. This is something that really raises people's anger um, and is, is certainly seen in the whole world as very provocative. Um, on the other hand, there is this there is this sense that Iran is a religious fanatic country that is willing to see um, as even even have uh, nuclear weapons fired at itself in order to wipe out Israel, and that's just preposterous. Uh, Iran has always been a rational player in world politics, in, which doesn't mean it's been nice, but it's it's pursued interests and tried to be a part of uh, the global community. The United States has not been uh, open to that since the revolution in 1979, but most of Europe has and has been dealing with Iran uh, ever since then. Uh, there's a competition in the region for, uh, you know, for regional power. So U.S., uh, as we all know, is, uh, you know, trying to get footholds in Iraq and, you know, they have presence in Afghanistan and other parts of the region. So there's a competition for who could be, uh, you know, leading uh, or who could be a kind of a regional power. And Iran is trying to be a regional superpower. But I don't think currently they're posing a serious threat to U.S. Iran has always seen itself on the sidelines of Middle East politics. The vast majority of the Middle East is Sunni, but the majority of Iraq, and almost all of Iran is Shia. A notable exception is Iran's Jewish population with full political rights and a seat in parliament. Ahmadinejad is worried about being perceived as aligned with the U.S. As absurd as it sounds from a U.S. perspective, the U.S.-backed Shia government in Iraq looks like conspiracy to others. His audience is mostly the Arab populations outside of Iran. By pandering to anti-Israel sentiment, he tries to present himself as a leader in the Muslim world. Ahmadinejad, a mirror image of Bush in many ways, is also trying to appeal to his base, Iranian fundamentalists and the military. 
Israel might be wiped off the map. And he stands up, he says Israel should be wiped off the map. Wiped off the map. Eliminate Israel from the face of the earth. Wiped off the map. Wipe Israel off the map. Wiped off the map. Wiped off the map. Destruction of Israel. Israel should be wiped off the map. Are we going to have to wait until there's a mushroom cloud over Jerusalem? I think one of the things that we hear about Iran that's misleading is that the president, Ahmadinejad, is said to be really the person who's in charge in Iran. And in point of fact, especially when it comes to foreign policy, it's the, it's the Ayatollah Khomeini who's really in charge. And so we get a lot of, the, the media tends to report when Ahmadinejad says these really crazy things like it wants to wipe Israel off the map. But what it doesn't report is when um, Ayatollah Khomeini says that Iran is willing to back the Saudi peace plan uh, in the Middle East, which really is a plan to um, normalize relations with Israel if Israel withdraws entirely from the occupied territories in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem. We don't hear about that. So we know that we're being set up to demonize, to, to think of Iran as, as this horrible country and really to demonize it. What must be understood is that the office of the president of Iran is not the same as the office of the president of the United States. The media should be focusing on Ahmadinejad's boss, the supreme leader, Grand Ayatollah Khamenei. He has total power over the foreign policy, over the military, and the nuclear program. Also left out of the media campaign is Iran's 2003 offer to President Bush. In exchange for being removed from the axis of evil, a guarantee of security, lifting of the sanctions, and allowing Europe to resume investing in Iran, Khamenei approved an offer to put all outstanding issues on the table. He offered to allow full nuclear inspections, to withdraw support for Hezbollah and Hamas, and to normalize relations with Israel if Israel withdraws from the occupied territories. The offer was delivered to Washington by a Swiss diplomat who was censured for even acknowledging it. The U.S. chose escalation over peaceful resolution. The president of Iran is somewhat of a figurehead, and in order to gain influence, he is trying to appeal to the resentment of America and Israel that is rampant throughout the region. In order to understand this hostility and why Ahmadinejad got elected, and why no leader dares to appear pro-U.S. or even to trust the U.N., it is essential to understand the history of modern Iran. For most Americans, the story begins in 1979 with the Iranian Revolution and the hostage crisis. A group of revolutionary university students took over the American embassy in Tehran and held 52 diplomats hostage for 444 days. To help burn this into the American narrative, the news show Nightline was created with a nightly tally of the number of days since the crisis started. But to really understand, we have to go back to 1953, which is where the story begins for most Iranians. This was the year that the U.S. overthrew Iran's democracy and installed the Shah, a pro-U.S. dictator. In 1951, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh was the first elected official who was appointed as Prime Minister of Iran by popular demand. He saw that the wealth needed to build Iran was leaving the country because over the past 50 years, its vast oil reserves were under British control at the hands of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, later to become BP, or British Petroleum. So Mossadegh became hugely popular for nationalizing the oil industry and taking back the oil. Hugely popular at home, but quite unpopular with the British government. Britain took Iran to the world court over the matter and lost. They tried to hit Iran's economy by blockading the Gulf and halting trade. They tried to convince the U.S. to assist with regime change, but then-President Truman was not interested. However, when U.S. President Eisenhower took office in 1953, Britain was able to persuade him under the Cold War pretext that Mossadegh relied on Iran's Communist Party for power. The newly formed CIA was sent to engineer a coup, 
codenamed Operation Ajax. Iran's monarch, the Shah, returned to power. He had previously been weakened by the new parliament, a short democratic experiment designed to limit his powers. After 1953, he returned fully backed by UK and US power, and the oil was soon flowing under control of Britain, America, the Netherlands, and France. The Shah became increasingly arrogant, opulent, and autocratic over his 25-year rule. He instilled fear in the population with a secret police known as Savak, created by the American CIA and Israeli Mossad, that tortured and imprisoned those who dared to dissent. He crushed all political opposition. Troops were sent to massacre demonstrators. He pushed a white revolution to modernize and westernize the country, giving women the right to vote and other reforms. But ultimately, he served the elites and created a huge economic gap for the poor masses. Powerful religious leaders saw that he was forcibly trying to rid Iran of Islam in a country that was 90% Muslim. One of the Shah's leading critics, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, was arrested and imprisoned for 18 months. After his release in 1964, Khomeini was sent into exile for 14 years. From abroad, he continued his anti-US, anti-Shah campaign through sermons on cassette tapes that made their way back into Iran and circulated as people copied and shared them. By the end of the 1970s, things had gotten so bad that major protests and the violence that followed were becoming a regular occurrence. The Shah declared martial law and banned demonstrations. This resulted in a huge protest and a general strike that shut down the economy. Soon over two million people flooded a public square in Tehran, demanding to remove the Shah and for Khomeini to return. And that is exactly what happened. One important thing to note is that the CIA orchestrated the 1953 coup out of the very same American embassy in Tehran that was later the site of the hostage crisis, right after the Shah was overthrown by popular revolution in 1979. The students were convinced that once again, the U.S. had plans to overthrow their revolution. In fact, U.S. President Carter did send a NATO general to instigate a military coup, but it failed. Iran and the U.S. had an extradition treaty in force that obligated the Carter administration to return the Shah to Iran as an indicted criminal. The students had four demands. Return the Shah to Iran for trial. He had been accepted into America for medical treatment. Return the Shah's wealth to the Iranian people. A promise from the U.S. not to interfere in Iran's affairs in the future and an apology and admission of guilt by the U.S. for its past actions in Iran. The apology never came, but 20 years later, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright did acknowledge the U.S. role in Mossadegh's overthrow. So Khomeini took power in 1979 and instituted a government under Islamic law. Within a year of the revolution, Saddam Hussein invaded Iran without provocation seeking control of Iran's oil-rich Khuzestan region and key oil-shipping waterways. The resulting Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 1988 was the longest and one of the most devastating conventional wars of the century. At least half a million Iranians were killed. This war further cemented resentment of the U.S. government as they were playing both sides. On one hand, they were supporting Iraq providing money, technology, and intelligence, including satellite photography, to help Iraqi bombing raids. The U.S. helped provide Saddam Hussein with weapons by giving him agricultural credits and pressuring Gulf states to give him billions in loans so he could buy weapons from Western Europe, China, and Russia. The U.S. Department of Commerce issued licenses to export materials for Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program. The U.S. continued its support even after learning that Iraq was using chemical weapons against Iran, not to mention against its own citizens, to stop an uprising of us otherwise. The U.S. government does not place a high priority on preventing terrorism. Before the recent Iraq war started, there was plenty of intelligence predicting that the war would increase terror, 
which happened as predicted. The thing I'm most concerned about is that all these efforts on the part of the United States government are creating an atmosphere which is enhancing terrorism all around the world. There was a study that was done called the, uh, the Iraq effect, and what he discovered is that the the amount of terrorism has increased seven times, sevenfold times since the United States has attacked. When a country is at war, it needs a strong leader who will not appease its enemies. It must convince the population that its enemies are irrational and bent on its destruction. It works for the hardliners in Tehran, just like it works for the hard... Iraq, terrorism all around the world. And that's going to that's gonna be one of the effects if the United States attacks uh, Iran. The constant threat of an enemy gets hardliners the support of the population. Remember how most Americans felt on 9-11. And the current president, Ahmadinejad, is somebody who loves to make provocative speeches um, and to do some really awful things. Uh, the particularly for Jews and for Israel, uh, the the conference that was held in Tehran a few months ago that was essentially a celebration of Holocaust denial. Uh, however, however, Iran tried to, to sort of tone that down. That's essentially what it was. This is something that really raises people's anger um, and is, is certainly seen in the whole world as very provocative. Um, on the other hand, there is this, there is the... ...headliners in Washington. This brings us to Ahmadinejad, the much maligned, ultra-conservative president of Iran. As can be expected, his unrepentant, anti-Zionist, anti-Israel displays and defiance of U.S. demands to abandon the nuclear energy program are the media focus for our official enemy. When it comes to Iran, I think it's important that people keep Iran in perspective. Iran does have uh, real ambitions of, of being a major, major power in the Middle East, and that's, that's something to take very seriously.